about the sons of God coming into the daughters of men and what that whole thing is really about. Now, one of the reasons why it got into the whole uh, sons of God coming into the daughters of men and about the race of giants is because they knew, you know, even back then, they knew about the giants on the planet. They knew that there was proof. They knew that the ancient civilization spoke of giants. I showed you guys in ancient Kemen about the, you know, the hieroglyphs when it's basically kind of giving you depictions and the oppression of giants. They understood this. And one of the things that they always do is they always cover their ass. So they can use the whole giant thing to basically fall into, uh, to get people to fall into their whole scheme of the Bible, which we see that's what happens. Whenever somebody finds anything pertaining to giants, it always goes to the Nephilim and goes into, you know, the fallen angels or what have you. But it's just them really covering up for the fact that giants was on the planet. And it has nothing to do, of course, with anything biblical. It's just these race of giants or whoever these beings are that was here existed. And they know the proof that they existed is out there and it's going to be coming up. And they don't know when some government or some person might stumble upon something that uh, is going to prove without a shadow of a doubt that they can't control that the giants, in fact, existed or, you know, was real. But a lot of that is already out there, as you probably already seen. So that's just one part of it. Now, the part that worries me the most about, you know, that whole thing in Genesis, because it implies a lot, which we'll touch on as we go. It implies too many things about basically telling you and giving you the understanding that beings came from space to the planet and somehow you know we get the um it's gonna make a lot of sense later <laughs> we get the impression of mating that's how they just give it to us outright came into the daughters of man and basically had sex and the women bear these giants and it's another way of looking at it when you dig deeper into the book of Enoch, which we'll touch on that, in, you know, a little maybe later on, but not right now. It does fit now, but you'll you'll understand later. But it's touching on a lot What it's touching about that when it's talking about that, because it's implying too many different things that will fit later. But it's it's big. It's one of the only things that worries me about all of this. And we'll I'm going to touch on that later because it's like, you know. Just one. Look at the whole thing about God. You go into the book of Enoch explanation of basically these beings defying God coming to earth and having sex with the women and doing what they're doing. And basically the earth getting out of control to the point where God destroys it. So you have to look at that and say, oh, come on. Now, you know, God exists. If you knew he was real and he created you and he has these outrageous powers, he can do anything. Why would you mess up? Why would you do anything to the point where he can he has the power to destroy everything you've done and you, you know, so the story about these fallen angels coming down and doing something they ain't supposed to do against a being of all power or what have you don't make sense. It does not fit. But from my research and everything I've been talking about through my videos, as I said, there was a war. Something happened. And this is what it's alluding to in Genesis when it's talking about God destroying the earth with a flood. But the part that people is forgetting is how technologically advanced that civilization was before this. Now, it's only hitting and alluding to it in certain points. But when you really grasp what it's saying, we're talking about a civilization that existed on this planet that was amazing, that was advanced. Now, the Bible in uh, certain points is going to give you them, you know, being evil, monsters, what have you. Same thing in the book of Enoch, but the book of e Enoch is the most in giving away uh, the, uh, the advancement of these people. And um, we see this. We see this advanced civilization and them basically going against power, whoever's in power or God or what have you, and then everything being destroyed with a flood, which is, you know, when you get into the whole Noah's Ark story. So we know. You know, something happened on this planet and then it was washed away. And that's basically what it looked like. It was planet was scorched with fire and then water. And it's basically what it seems like happened. And some survived. You know, you have Noah's Ark, 
where it's telling you that everybody was wiped out except him and his family, which when you really get into it, you know, uh, was talking about the bloodline of him and everything like that. Basically saying it could have been, you know, let's say humans and other kinds of beings on this planet. And then everybody else was taken away or wiped out except for the humans, which is, which is what it's really alluding to. It said everybody who was here besides humans was here. Something happened. And or you could just even say different species is no longer here. Who knows? But we know they were all wiped out and gone except for us. This race. This is what it's talking about. This is what fits with everything else. We look at the planet. We look at you know what's here. And we look at the fact that it seems as if everything just picks up from ancient Kemet. And, you know, we know we can go back and we look at the time frame of that. And we know those pyramids are old, but it's giving you, you know, uh, basically something that happened and kind of give you. We're going to touch on this in a second, but kind of giving you an understanding of what took place. But you have. Noah's Ark, you have these people coming out, you have all this destruction that happened, and then all of a sudden you find you have man basically trying to recreate or, you know, live out after this destruction. So, you know, skip all the hoopla, Noah's Ark happened, whatever like that, and then, you know, the Bible, according to the Bible, and then you have, you know, the uh, sons of, of uh, Noah and everything, and them basically going out and multiplying and the whole story of Ham, Shem, and Japheth, or what have you. And basically alluding to the uh, reestablishment or man basically reestablishing himself uh, on the planet and going out and spreading and multiplying or what have you. But it's interesting. Skip all the he begot who and he begot him or what have you. And you get to eventually Abraham. So who will become Abraham later on. So you get to Abraham uh, in Genesis and it just comes out with the story and eventually it just basically stops it stops with the genealogy and it gives you genesis uh 11 1 through 9 which i talked about a few times where you had man basically re-establishing himself so when it's talking about in genesis about you know man becoming being of one speech it's really getting into uh Man after the flood, reestablishing civilization and being one and everything is fine and well and good. This is after the whatever happened. And it's sort of alluding to a little bit some of the things that it's talking about. So, you know, when it's saying Genesis 11, 1, you know, the whole earth uh, was of one language and one speech, you know, and it came to pass as they journeyed from east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, go to let us make brick. Now I broke this down in an earlier video about how when you take this stuff back to Hebrew, how it's giving you a different story. And it's important because it all really fits in now when you begin to understand what it's talking about. So it's talking about the civilization. And when you start breaking it back, it gives you the different story about how people was united they was of one accord one speech they was united they was had they had unity they was doing something and everything was fine and dandy until something caused them to move from where they was to go to a place that was like sheol or hell so as i talked about in that uh, earlier video about how they left i was giving you sort of a, a, a allusion to something that happened so they was made to go and it's basically talking about the Africans going into Kemet, which, as I talked about before, the pyramids was already there. And they was trying to rebuild them or reconstruct them in order to um, basically accomplish something. So when you start to break down the story, you have Africans basically coming out of this catastrophe, going up into Kemet and trying to. Remember, trying to reestablish civilization and understand what happened, what took place. And as it's given you when Genesis is saying, you know, whoever is in charge, which I will say the powers that be, basically, you know, confounded their speech. But what's interesting is, you know, when it's talking about, as I said, uh, uh, make brick, when you break it down, it means be white. So the word for brick is law ban. And law ban means be white white 
doesn't really seem like much on the surface until you understand that when you get into start getting into the story and get into the Tower of Babel, and it's talking about how the Lord came down to see this the, uh, tower in the city in which the the uh, the uh, the children of men you know had built. So you have basically this God or the powers that be, whoever it's talking about, coming to see what they was doing. And this all goes and fits into the book of Enoch because we're talking about the Tower of Babel. We're talking about the uh, children of, of, you know, the so-called fallen angels, the post came down and been doing all this stuff in the book of Enoch. But when you understand on the surface what it's saying, it's talking about men, Africans, doing something. Recreating to me from my research, recreating the pyramids, trying to rebuild and figure out the past and um, basically get off this planet. In my understanding, we will touch on this later. But um, then when you get into the biblical understanding of how they're trying to switch it up, because they're taking that story and giving you uh, this being because they because they did this or because they were trying to do this, this somehow being. The reason why, you know, they had to be stopped or they had to send in the white man to basically infiltrate and change all this. As I said, when you start reading through the story and um, you start deciphering it and switching it back to Hebrew, it's talking about let us go down there and infiltrate, uh, infiltrate them and, you know, confound their speech or what have you. So it's giving you that. But again, this going into the book of Enoch and we start getting into the book of Enoch coming right out of the Noah's Ark story. We understand, you know, when Noah was born, it's white. And, you know, to everybody else, that's so what? But when you read in the story, it's giving you clear as day that his parents was black, clearly, or else they wouldn't be so shocked. So when you go into the book of Enoch, let me just read this. It's saying, after a time, my son Methuselah took a wife for his son, Lamech. She became pregnant by him and brought forth a child, the flesh of which was white as snow and red as a rose. The hair of whose head was white like wool and long and whose eyes were beautiful. When he opened them, he illuminated all the house like the sun, the whole house abundant with light. And when he was taken from the hand of the midwife, opening also his mouth, he spoke to the Lord of righteousness. Then Lamech, his father, was afraid of him and flying away, came to his own father, Methuselah, and said, I have begotten a son unlike to other children. He is not human, but resembling the offspring of the angels of heaven is of a different nature from ours, being altogether unlike us. So again, understand, you know, if you have Noah supposedly being this white man and then the flood happens and you have Noah's offspring basically reestablishing civilization, you know, where's the black man in all this? Clearly, it's telling you Noah wasn't black in the book of Enoch. And it's one of the reasons why I was taken out of the Bible, because that gives away too much. And I told you about how uh, the creator or the person who gave us the um of Enoch uh, was a mason and how he went into Ethiopia and just came back out of nowhere uh, with these three manuscripts that nobody could find, you know, prior. He just comes out of nowhere with three, not one, but three uh, book, books of Enoch that supposedly the Ethiopians had all this time, but clearly they didn't because nobody could find one. So again, the story was given to us for a reason for many different things. And, you know, they're going to probably try to say uh, if they're going to use this stuff biblically because they lose in that fight, by the way, this whole biblical thing. What they wanted to do, which we'll touch on, because they had a whole entire plan for this book that has been basically scrapped because of so much information uh, uh, coming out, which is one of the reasons why they have to get rid. I told you, I told you guys, they got to get rid of the Internet. All this shit is going to be gone. And for you people who buy this stuff and who starting to get it, you're going to have this information. Nobody else is going to have it. The people who ain't getting it not going to have this stuff. This shit will be going. Do you think they're going to let, they, let us keep doing this forever? No, because we hurting too much. This information is going to be gone because there's no way they can move forward with this kind of information being out there. They're going to get rid of it and they're going to let generations pass. This is their MO. 
They're going to let generations pass without this information and without access to it. It's just going to be gone and wiped out from everywhere. And whoever have it and have the knowledge to pass down to their children, they're going to be the only ones who know it. So it's, it's, it's really important to get this stuff. But one of the goals um, for them was to make it as if you see it's talking about Noah being basically white and resembling the uh, the angels from heaven, which according to them is white. And then you have uh, Gaia, Gaia. You have people like them and other people trying to give you these extraterrestrial white looking beings to try to give you the connection with the fallen angels and how they looked. So you also have people saying, OK, well, it's talking about in the book of Enoch. It's, it's telling you about, you know, Noah being white and having hair like wool. Who else had hair like wool? Jesus, according to the description in the Bible. So you have that argument as well. You know, they try to make those comparisons. You see what they're doing. This is really subtle, but they're going to eventually try to bring this thing all together. And in, in a later in later generations that will be born into or you guys will be born into those who don't make it. And this information that we're talking about is going to be gone plain and simple so then they could just come out with this information and make it as if because that bible ain't going nowhere make it as if uh they're going to put themselves biblically into positions of power i told you how the rothschilds wanted to come out in the year 2000 and try to make it as if their bloodline is the bloodline of jesus christ and everything like that but again too much information has gotten out and they, they couldn't do it so understand what i'm saying how all this is fitting so you know from one one point, they kind of sort of making it like they created the white race to be in opposition to African people because uh, we was getting too far. And that's basically what it's saying when you try to break it down. But at the same time, giving you another story about how you had this technologically advanced civilization that was destroyed for whatever reason. And you had the flood. And again, you got to ask yourself the question if Noah is white. And then you have the uh, offspring of Noah, who is supposedly, you know, they should, they should look like him. They shouldn't be like um, the original people, you know, uh, who would be Noah's family, who was, and everybody else who was all wiped out. But again, uh, remember, uh, Noah supposed to have the pure bloodline, which is why he was spared. So his family should have the same pure bloodline because it's the line he came from. So we can't say, you know, because because that's kind of that's what throws it off. Because remember, the whole reason why Noah was chosen is because he had the pure bloodline. The whole reason why Noah was chosen is because he had the pure bloodline. So if Noah supposedly had the pure bloodline or was untainted by what, what everybody else uh, was going through and wasn't affected by what everybody else was going through, you know, how could he be pure if he came out completely not like his parents? So how was Noah perfect in his generation? Was he perfect because he was the first albino or was he the first white person? Think about it. We're talking about metaphors here with Genesis. The flood, we know it happened for real on this planet. Not like Genesis is telling us as far as everybody dying. We know people had survived. So if you look at it metaphorically as saying Noah, we know coming from black people, what them saying is we know white folks come from black folks. But this Noah was white, just like we know the albinos and white people come from black folks. So him being perfect in his generation is like them saying he is perfect because he is the first white person. Plain and simple. Now go into the bloodline and we can look at, you know, Ham, Shem and Japheth as them basically saying they would be the races coming from the true bloodline of the original man, which would be, you know, the Africans. So, again. The Book of Enoch was taken out for a reason. It's separate because it raises too many questions when you try to compare with the Bible itself and compare it to, you know, what's going on. But they gave us that for a reason for you to decipher it and put it in context. But getting back into Genesis 11, 1 through 9, the whole story, these people wasn't doing nothing wrong, plain and simple. And to have 
God supposedly come down there, compound his speech and scatter them and everything like that. And it's like, you know, for what? These people was, there was no threat. You're supposed to be God Almighty. What are you afraid of that these people are supposed to be doing? What's going on? So another thing to look at. So supposedly they were scattered. And uh, when you get back into the Bible, next thing you know, of course, we're talking about uh, Abraham. And he will eventually, you know, go where? So just think about everything that's happening now. You have the creation of man, right? You have uh, civilization on a planet that's advanced, being wiped out and destroyed. You have civilization regaining strength and coming together and doing whatever. And then you have uh, Abraham. You have this whole story of him. The first place this dude goes, you know, supposedly, according to the Bible, he goes into the land of Canaan and, um, God promised him, you know, his generations, you know, this land and everything like that. But famine breaks out, you know, why would God give you some land and this freaking famine breaks out, you know, what kind of powerful God does that. But where does this dude go? Egypt. So, you know, the whole story of Abraham going into Egypt, bringing his wife and him telling his wife, hey, I'm going I'm to tell everybody that you're my sister because I don't want them to kill me over you. I want to go over there and they'd be like, well, damn, you, you know, your wife fine as hell. We can kill you and take her. So I'm going to say you're my sister. And then, you know, the Pharaoh wanted her and then plagues fell on Egypt because God was pissed that his wife was with the Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh was like, yo, take your wife. Why you tell us it was your sister? Take her and get out of here. And they left with all this gold and cattle and everything like that. But it's giving you that connection with Kemet early in Genesis. A lot of people don't understand that. You know, it's not just, you know, we get into Exodus that we get into Kemet. Early in Genesis, we get into Kemet. So it gives you that connection. It's talking about later on when we get towards the end, how the new Pharaoh did not know Abraham or Abraham and had that connection and understand who he was. So... He's seen him as a threat. You know, these people are going to take over everything. We got to get rid of these people. These people are a threat straight up. And, you know, the whole enslavement supposedly ensued. So, again, one of the things uh, we can find the suspect in the Bible anyway is how they do not. They give us a pharaoh of Egypt. We're talking about how great and unbelievable Egypt uh, was. And then the Bible being this book that's supposedly giving us this information and knowledge does not go into Kemet, does not go deeper into who these pharaohs was, how the civilization of Kemet was established, uh, not even the building of the pyramids or mentioning the pyramids, which is weird. And then also, we don't get no full understanding of Hebrews as far as the beginning. So we can go from what they're telling us now about, you know, Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob, whatever like that, the uh, tribes and everything. But we get the first mention mention of Hebrew in Genesis uh, 14, 13. We don't get the first mention of Jew until uh, 2 Kings uh, 6, 16. Now, also using numerology, we can get the numbers 13 and 9 from both those numbers with uh, 14, 13. Uh, given that's when you add it together, you get uh, 1 and 4, which will give you 5 and you get one give you six plus three give you nine. There was second kings. You do multiplication. You get six times one is six, and six times six is thirty-six. Three and six is nine. In both cases, you get a six and a three to give us nine. But also with uh, the second kings, if you add six one six, it'll give you thirteen. So this is going to come up a lot with these numbers as we'll touch on as we go, and why they are important and why they are in many different places. As you'll see, I'm gonna try to get through all of them if possible. But we know it's not talking about no Hebrews, no origin story of the Egyptians, not really getting into it. Just all of a sudden in Genesis 14, 13, it's talking about Abraham, the Hebrew. And then he would eventually go into Egypt again. Another story with Egypt and his wife and him taking the, uh, the uh, maid as a, as a wife or, you know, getting her pregnant and everything like that. That whole story. So we have a whole nother story in Kemet. You have these stories that they're talking about in the Bible that the Egyptians are not talking about themselves and them again trying to interject themselves into ancient Kemet uh, before everything happened and trying to make that comparison. But again, the first civilization is attaching itself onto its ancient Egypt, which is why when we come out of uh, when you leave, when Genesis is ending off, it's ending off with them in Kemet 
going into the book of Exodus. But what Genesis has given us again, the creation story of us, how we came about, how we came into existence and given us in parable the destruction of the civilization that predates us. Now, we're going to come back into Genesis as we go along. And we'll do that with other books of the Bible as well, as we'll go back and touch on previous verses to make the point in these uh, later verses. But with Genesis, it's straightforward. It's given us the creation of us, the fact that something happened on this planet, basically the creation of the white man. We're going to get back into that whole book of Enoch thing. I don't want, to, want you to think I forgot about it. It just don't, it don't go yet. But you have to, again, we can't leave it out. We can't look at, we can't discount what it's telling us about the sons of God coming into the daughters of man and what that whole thing is really about. So it's giving you everything that basically took place that we don't know, that we don't have any real proof of, just they alluding to what happened before, you know, uh, the rise of the uh, dynasties of ancient Kemet, which would eventually arise. And it seems like civilization began with them. So Genesis is giving us this story and then we get into Exodus, which is giving us another false story with parables. But all of it is going to eventually lead us to the fall of Egypt, parabolized, of course, and the rise of their power, which is basically what it's talking about. And we, we can't forget in the mix of it all in Genesis, uh, giving us the Greek mythological stories as far as uh, Pandora's box I touched on that. When we get into Greek mythology part two DVD series, we're gonna get more into that. But um talked about it, Pandora's box, even the apple, uh through Kaleon and Pharaoh, Noah's Ark, and all that stuff like that. Those comparisons as well. So not only are they trying to give us what happened before the rise of the dynasties, but they're interjecting their own uh, Greek mythology into it as well in different places. And, you know, this is what Genesis is about. Now, one of the things we got to remember is that they are trying to, in Genesis, establish this faulty history for the Jews. So you got to really pay attention to what the Bible was saying and then compare it to the so-called Jewish history. You know, the reason they give behind the establishment of Israel for a nation. And it goes really beyond the Bible, which we'll get into. But... You got to remember when we're looking at it and reading, you know, they give us Hebrew, but they never really tell us where Hebrews come from. Just call, you know, Abraham the, the Hebrew and never really gives you a give you a real history of the Hebrew people or why they call Hebrews or, you know, what that really does mean uh, in the beginning of Genesis. It's just out of nowhere. We get Hebrews. So you also got to understand that, you know, when they when they wrote the King James Version, they were establishing this history like they already had the plan laid out of what they wanted to do and already was implement imp, implementing the plans uh, for a long time. But, you know, with the King James Version, they had to really uh, establish this faulty history to kind of sort of make up for the history that they was going to be uh, giving us with the uh, Arabs as well as the Jews. So. One of the things you'll see, and a lot of people understand this already, is when you have uh, Abraham, Abraham being basically promised Israel in the Bible, you know, his his seed, his generations, his offsprings or what have you, it's going to be promised Israel and everything like that. So what a lot of people don't realize is Abraham comes from Mesopotamia, which is basically Iraq. So a lot of people uh, don't understand the whole entire co conflict between the Arabs and the Jews as far as the whole Israel-Palestine thing. So in Genesis, it really starts to set the tone for that when you start to understand. So when you go and you read here, Genesis chapter uh, 24, it says, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant, of the house of his house that ruled over all that he had put I pray thee thy hand under my thigh and I will make thee swear by the Lord the God of heaven and the God of the earth that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell so we know the Canaanites we know about Canaan we understand 
Abraham going into Canaan and Canaan being Israel. So he's telling his servant not to take any wives for my son from Israel. But he says for him to go basically here. He says, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, part of venture, the woman will not be willing to follow me unto the land. So skip here. It says here, verse 10. And the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. So it's one of the biggest issues in the Bible that people do not understand. Even in the beginning, when you talk about where the establishment, where the birthplace, we're talking about the ancestors, the beginning for the uh, the Jewish or the Hebrews starts with Abraham. You know, it starts with Abraham. So Abraham coming from Mesopotamia, not Israel. So what is so important about Israel? Now, again, when we go here and read in Genesis, and this is Genesis uh, chapter 11, verse 31. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees, which Ur is in Iraq or Mesopotamia, to go into the land of Canaan. And they came into Haran and dwelt there. 